Harry's Wife, Part 74.4 What Goes On Below I've explained to you about how narcissists are divided into aware and unaware. Aware narcissists are extremely rare. Unaware narcissists are more prevalent. The unaware narcissist doesn't know that they seek the prime aims fuel, control, character traits, and residual benefits. They know that they engage in certain behaviours, though not always, and the reason motivating them, the feeling motivating them, is separate and distinct from that of what they understand in terms of the reason they're actually doing it. So, for instance, Harry's wife will behave in a particular manner in order to assert control and draw fuel. She doesn't realise that's why she's doing it. She's doing it because she believes that she's entitled to receive something, or she's led to believe that somebody's got it in for her, or that she is envious of somebody and they should be moved out of her way. The narcissism causes those feelings and those thoughts in order to galvanise and motivate her to take those particular steps. With regard to your own dealings with narcissists, most of you, indeed nearly all of you, will have been involved directly with unaware narcissists, the lessers and the mid-rangers. And of course, if you want to understand particularly which sub-school you've been involved with, you can do no better than utilise my NARC detector consultation details in the video description. Check out the testimonials also of those who've used it and found it to be extremely helpful. However, it's important to understand what's actually going on below. And using the prominent example of Harry's wife, I'm going to give you further instances utilised from photographs so that you can understand what's actually going through her mind, what's motivating her behaviours in the situations and the consequential appearance of that in the interaction and dynamic that is shown in the photograph. As always, it's worth repeating, you can't tell from one photograph. You have to look at a series of them. And having established that an individual is a narcissist, you are then able to interpret that behaviour through the prism. I noticed yesterday that somebody in the comments on the blinking video made the mention of the fact, oh goodness, I blink a lot. Am I a narcissist? No, you've misunderstood. I'm not saying that because you blink a lot that makes you a narcissist. What I'm saying is when you've established that somebody is a narcissist and they blink a lot, it means that there is a threat to control and they're experiencing low fuel levels. Somebody who blinks a lot, that doesn't mean that they're a narcissist. You have to look at a range of indicators and behaviours over a sustained period of time. There are people who aren't narcissists who might blink a lot because they're anxious, but their anxiety doesn't stem from a loss of control or low fuel levels. It comes from elsewhere. And it's very important to make that distinction. And of course, these are understandable comments because they're coming from people that aren't experts. I am the expert. That's why you're here. Listen and learn from me. And as always, if you need bespoke assistance with regard to your own situation, utilise the consultations that I provide. That is what they're there for. Anyway, let us now turn to the relevant photographs. Our first photograph shows the Ginger Prince in close-up with Harry's wife. It looks like he's just said something or is about to say something. And the expression on her face is one whereby there is a smugness combined with contempt. In essence, what's going on here is that her mind, by her narcissism, is thinking, you idiot, you absolute plank of a man. I've got you where I want you, your putty right in the middle of my hand, but my God, you can be a buffoon. In that instance, Harry has been painted black. He will have affected control in some way. He will have offended by challenging either through wounding or challenge fuel her unconscious need for control. Her narcissism then, in order to cause her to devalue him, has caused her to think of him as a lowlife, as a dumb fuck, as an idiot, as a clown. And there is a combination of both contempt and smugness. Smugness in terms of, I'm better than you, and you're under my control, but also contempt, you sorry excuse for a man. 
The feeling of contempt, of course, is generated by her narcissism to make her feel superior to him in order that she can devalue and assert control. The smugness is also a feeling that is generated by her narcissism. It then fills her mind with thoughts along the lines of those that I've just articulated to you so that she is motivated both through feeling and thought. Harry has been lambasted and is no doubt to receive more. He is in a devaluation and this photograph catches a moment of that devaluation. The smug contempt that she has. This also demonstrates, of course, the complete absence of emotional empathy, because somebody who would have emotional empathy wouldn't look like that at the person that they're married to and that they supposedly love. This demonstrates love is absent, and of course we know it is when it comes to the narcissist, because we have no emotional empathy, and we are not capable of love. It is an emotion that we are not fixed with. And this little close-up provides us with an excellent example of devaluation and the motivation of the narcissist to assert control and draw fuel through contempt and smugness. Of course, in the moment, the facade has slipped. It only takes a microsecond to be able to take such a photograph in its telling, and it may well be the case, as we've seen in some of the videos, that thereafter, and I'll be examining this further with regard to the implementation and resurrection of the facade in part 74.5. But what we're able to see is in that microsecond, in that particular moment, we witness the contempt and the smugness. It appears. It might last for a few seconds. It might just be for that microsecond. But once again, because this is clearly caught at a public event, the facade slips for a moment and we get that little glimpse of what's actually going on below. Turning to our next photograph, here we see the return of the Death Stare. No prizes for guessing who the recipient is of this laser-like beam boring into the side of her face. Of course, it's Catherine, Duchess of Cambridge, the nemesis, or at least one of the nemesis, of Harry's wife. The photograph has captured in an instant that piercing, hate-filled gaze, envy, antipathy. Catherine appears on the radar. In that moment, her narcissism, namely that of Harry's wife, asks in the unconscious, is Catherine under control? Answer, no. Moreover, Catherine has witnessed being her engaging, empathic self Interacting with people, shaking their hands. Have you travelled far? How are you? How lovely to see you. Oh, thank you for that gift of the posy of flowers, etc. In her well-meaning and engaging manner. She is able to do it naturally. And people gravitate towards her. At that moment, people are focused on Catherine. And they're not focused upon Harry's wife. Her envy is activated through the ignition of fury. And in that instant, the hate-filled gaze comes her way, as if to say, I would love nothing more than be able to pull a scythe from my handbag, run over and decapitate you. Believe me, those are the thoughts that run through the mind of the narcissist in order to motivate the narcissist to do something. Not in terms of motivating the narcissist to actually go and kill another person, although that can actually happen, but more usually to motivate the narcissist to seek fuel and draw attention onto themselves in an alternative way. The ignition of the fury girds the loins of the narcissist, motivating them to do something, to spur into action, to take those steps, to ensure that they gather fuel by suddenly turning and talking to somebody in a louder voice, to overshadow the other person of whom they're envious to perhaps make a kerfuffle to draw all eyes onto them. As I mentioned before, the pervert lesser that goes and sticks his genitalia into the wedding cake, or the middle middle range type B at the funeral who starts the wailing and the, and the, the weeping, so all eyes, Oh, Uncle Albert, how I missed you. Please, I wish you weren't gone. Whereas she's not bothered with Uncle Albert in the last decade. The hypocrisy of the narcissist, of course.
Here, the narcissism engenders envy towards Catherine to motivate Harry's wife to then go and take steps to reassert control indirectly, she won't approach her directly, and to gather fuel from other people. Our third example can probably be best described as a shit-eating grin. There is a smile, the teeth are on display, but the overall expression is not one of happiness or delight, but rather trying to smile through something that is entirely unpalatable and unpleasant. We once again see our friend, the rictus grin, plastered across the face, the jutting jaw. Notice the neck. Stiff, veins prominent. The eyes staring ahead. There is an attempt to generate happiness, but once again the eyes belie what is actually occurring. The features are not warm, not soft, they're contorted, wax-like, fixed in a particular position. In this instance, this is the facade in action, trying to demonstrate happiness, pleasure at being wherever it is that she is. However, the facade again struggles to impose this in a meaningful way. There is evidently some form of challenge to control having just taken place and having dealt with it or feeling the residue of it, Harry's wife, her, her, her facade is trying to make the best of the difficult circumstances by basically shrugging it off as almost to say, nothing to see here, everything's okay, there isn't a problem. But the expression tells us that there is. The expression tells us that something that has occurred that has threatened the sense of control. Something has occurred that has caused her to have her fury ignited. However, given the circumstances and the fact that evidently it's in public, a direct assertion of control by the imposition of heated or cold fury is denied. Similarly, smearing or malign triangulation is also denied to her by way of the second assertion of control. And therefore, she has to remain in a position of withdrawal, withdrawal in her head, thinking, all I would like to do now is shove ground glass under the eyelids of that person that's just offended me, or equivalent thoughts of, who does that person think they are, or who do they think they are to speak to me like that, or they're a nobody. That regularly occurs in the mind of the narcissist because the narcissism makes the narcissist think that way, but prevents them, through the imposition of the facade, from acting any further on it. By creating the idea that the narcissist is superior in the narcissist's mind, namely, I'm better than you because you are basically a worthless individual and I'd love nothing more than to squish you out of existence, the narcissist is then able to feel superior and, in the unconscious, creates the idea of control. Externally, the narcissist should not be there with gnashing teeth and steam coming out of the ears and eyes ablaze, because, of course, that would not fit with the facade. Some narcissists, of course, greater than the ultra, can be thinking the most malevolent thoughts about an individual while smiling, charmingly shaking hands and looking to all intents and purposes if there is no problem whatsoever. Mid-rangers struggle with it, and intermittently that facade slips. Now, for Harry's wife, it doesn't slip for a sustained period of time, namely she goes ape and starts bashing people over the head with her clutch handbag or gouging their eyes out. Instead, what we get treated to, if you can call it as such, is the intermittent display for a microsecond or two or three or four or five seconds, not long at all before the facade fights its way back and imposes itself. So it isn't the dropping of the facade for a sustained period of time, but rather little holes that are being punched in the facade, little glimpses of what goes on below. And once again, we see a further example of that as we witness the facade trying to stay intact despite there is a threat to control trying to destabilise it. And that's a very good example captured by this shit-eating grin. In our fourth picture, we're treated to the Ginger Prince and the eyes are fixed and locked upon him. The Ginger Poodle 
This is probably in the earlier days when his confidence levels were far higher than the browbeaten individual that he has become of late, is holding forth. He's discussing something, expressing an opinion. We can see that he's talking. He has either interrupted his wife or the simple fact is that because all eyes are on him and not her, her facade slips for the moment again, that micro-expression. Here, there is a look of, why are you doing this? Why aren't you engaging with me? Why are you leaving me out? And it is a pity play. Now, of course, exhibiting a pity play when she's attending some kind of royal function, some uh, professional obligation as a role of the Duchess of Sussex, isn't appropriate. It's bad form to do it. Harry is being Harry, chatting the way. And her narcissism means that because all eyes are on him, he's the one getting the fuel, not that he needs it. And because all eyes are on him, they're not on her, and it undermines her sense of control. As you'll recall from the video, Harry's wife, 73.6, rapid blinking. Why? The fact that somebody else is receiving the fuel, threatens her sense of control, that she doesn't like being the support act to anybody else, because in her world, she's queen of everything. And once again, in this instance, rather than us actually see the ignited fury appearing as a death stare, or frustration and annoyance, it actually manifests through cold fury as a pity play, that she feels sorry for herself. Her narcissism tells her it's not fair that he's hogging all the limelight. Try and get his attention so that he focuses on you. And what we see is the facade slipping for that microsecond again, and underneath is that pity play, an attempt to assert control directly over Harry by essentially tugging on his heartstrings to make him think, well, what is it? What's the matter? And in the instance that he notices that, he turns and he's giving control to her and giving her fuel. Eyes are back on her. But of course, that pity play is out of place. It's not the time. Certainly a pity play would be done behind closed doors or perhaps in a function where it's just the two of them where they've broken off and they're not actually engaging with everybody. Perhaps they're stood to one side, nibbling on some canop canapes. But here, it's clear that the two of them are at an event, at some kind of function, some perhaps opening of a cheese factory or such like, and therefore, turning and giving a pity play is completely out of place. But her narcissism dictates it necessary as a response to the threat to her control. And the facade slips for the moment, so that if anybody else happened to be looking at her, they'd think, why is she looking at him like that? Why isn't she smiling and looking encouraging? Why isn't she engaging? The reason being is she's being wounded, her control is being threatened, her fuel levels are plummeting, and her narcissism fumbles around and hits the switch. Pity play. It isn't the right manipulation at that juncture. It may well work, of course, in terms of operating to get Harry's attention, to draw him back onto her, provide the fuel and control. But if anybody else is observing, they think, that she's a bit strange, suddenly looking forlorn like that, and that's because the facade has gone missing for that picosecond. Again, a very useful opportunity to see a different form of manipulation behind the facade, so that you know what is going on below. And no photo analysis would be complete without yet another death stare between Harry's wife and her nemesis, Catherine, Duchess of Cambridge. Here, we will see, although they're sporting rather fetching pink hula hoops in this picture. There's appearance, I think, that it was at a mental health forum of such like. And Catherine is speaking. She's articulating, engaging with somebody beyond Harry's wife. Eyes are on Catherine. She is centre stage. And it demonstrates the inability of the facade to remain intact. That once again comes the poisonous glare right next to her. It's unclear as to whether Catherine can actually see this, and of course it will only be for a moment that's been captured in this particular photograph, but once again the fact that her attention is on Catherine, and it is her nemesis that is speaking, wounds Harry's wife. Her fury ignites. It's cold fury. The narcissism needs to motivate her in order to regain control. 
She can't do so directly through the first assertion of control because that would necessitate her lunging at Kate and pulling her hair, perhaps delivering a slap round the chops, or suddenly interrupting and saying something unpleasant. Or causing her to interrupt by making a particular point. But the narcissism doesn't take her down that road because of the lack of guarantee that it would be effective. As a mid-range narcissist, there is some capability there of the narcissism to assess the effectiveness beforehand. If she were a lesser, she'd have probably just interrupted and spoken over Catherine for the purposes of her own assertion of control and drawing fuel. However, as a mid-range narcissist, in this scenario, because of the presence of the facade, the direct assertion of control is denied to her. Indirect is also denied. She can't turn and talk to somebody else and say, ooh, listen to fancy knickers there, yakking on with a big ring on her finger and a lilac dress. Who does she think she is? Look at her merging into the background. Silly mare. She should have thought more carefully about what she wore. Well, I've got on. My jumpsuit or whatever it is is much nicer than what she's wearing. Don't you agree, Ginger Poodle? Yes, me lady says Prince Harry, thus allowing the indirect assertion of control. Can't do that. They're on the stage. Eyes are on them. Therefore, all that's left for her narcissism is to take her to the position of withdrawal, which is she remains quiet, and the narcissism allows her to think stink-eye thoughts. And as a consequence of that, her narcissism causes her to think, listen to her droning on. Just up her own arse, isn't she? Thinks she's so such a do-gooder. Well, I'll show her. And that reinforces her own sense of superiority, which allows the unconscious assertion of control. But of course, because she has those feelings of envy and those hateful thoughts, the facade struggles to keep them under wraps because her facade isn't all evolved enough. And once again, the facade slips just for a moment to allow us to see that poisonous death look saying, I hate you. Another Excellent example that demonstrates the effect of wounding on Harry's wife and the way that her narcissism responds to it to enable you to extend your knowledge. Please do like this video and express your appreciation in the comments and otherwise, as you may choose to do so, ensure that you share this video to people. Encourage them to come and learn more about narcissism using this example with me, the unrivaled expert, when it comes to helping you understand all about narcissism. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.